Welcome to Your Business, Your Life with Matt DeFrancesco, your personal financial technician. Whether you've had years of success in your business or just starting out, Highlift Financial can help you create a vision for your business, life, and family, and align these for generational wealth. As they say, what happens in your life affects your business. And now, on to the show. Well, hello and welcome to Your Business, Your Life with me, Matt Francesco. And, you know, I'm really excited to have this guest on because, you know, as I've been highlighting over the last couple episodes, one of the big focuses of my practice is this idea of transitioning. How are we going to move from one stage of life to the other and, and help that business owner to accomplish the goals that they want? I had mentioned that, you know, I'm involved with an organization called the Business Enterprise Institute, and I had the opportunity to be at their conference in August, and I got to meet my guest today and was really excited about some of the things that he's doing in this whole exit planning and continuity planning practice. So his name is Nicholas Neiman. He's a family business continuity attorney, and he spent the last 30 years working with family business leaders and trusted advisors around the United States to design and deploy critical actions that they need to grow, protect, and transition their family businesses. He and his team, they've helped over 1,200 business leaders and pioneers, as we're going to talk about, achieve real world fourth quarter results or fourth quarter. And I'm going to have him talk about that whole idea of what the fourth quarter is too. So I'm really excited to have Nick on. So Nick, welcome to your business, your life. Thank you, Matt. Pleasure to be here with you. Oh, thank you. You know what? I'm really excited about this because I really see it. You know, there's an old saying that says people don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. And I see this all the time, you know, working in the collision industry, most of the guys that I'm working with, they're grinders. They've been focused on pushing cars through their shops for 20, 30 years. And all of a sudden they kind of, sometimes they get to be about my age and they look up from under the hood. They kind of go, holy moly, I don't know what am I going to do with my life? And it's really just because they haven't planned. And so I like what you the, the, you know, with 30 years of being able to do this, some of the systems that you've helped to implement. So, but before we get into that, I just wanted you to just kind of bring briefly explain to the audience how you got into business continuity planning. Oh, sure. So I grew up in Quincy, Illinois, a small Midwest town, and a family that had a number of family businesses. So I've lived this all right. of my life and ended up going to, to school out in Omaha, Creighton University, College of Business, went on to law school. And so my focus has been with companies with small middle market family businesses my entire life. And largely the supermarket business is what my family was involved in as I grew up. So chance to really see a lot, do a lot, and carry that on throughout my college and law school, and then right on working with companies after that. So enjoyable, love working with family businesses of all types and sizes around the country. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting. I got a lot of my peers in the financial service industry, then they all want to work with, they all say, oh, I want to work with business owners. And I'm like, are you sure about that? Especially dealing with where, you know, look at 90% of businesses are family owned. There's some interesting dynamics that are there. I grew up in a family uh, law practice actually. So I'm kind of coming from the other way, and but I see the uh, challenges that the family business presents. So mm -hmm. I could certainly appreciate where you're coming from. Anyway, Nick, one of the things you talk about, and I highlighted this in the intro, was this idea of the pioneer mindset. And I know you state that those are the type of family businesses that you like to work with that carry this pioneer mindset. I wanted to see if you could explain that, because I think that's really a critical aspect to have, especially in today's world. Oh, it is. And as we all know, things are changing quickly. And if you want to stay in business, so Matt, you and I work with companies that want to stay in business, right? right. Whether it's for the next five, 10 years, 20 years of the current leaders, current owners that want to keep the business going, keep it strong, keep it working well for your colleagues that are in business with you. Right. And so how do you do that? And so I think we all know that we can't just sit back and say, this is how I've always done it. And so this is how I'm going to always do it in the future. That doesn't work. And it really never has worked but it especially doesn't work today as things are changing so quickly. And people tend to think, well, that's a change in technology. Well, that's part of it. But there's also a lot of changes in business models. How do you design your business to really create, capture value and fulfill for your customers or your clients? So we use what we refer to as a pioneer mindset, that the leaders in the company need to be thinking about not just how did I do it yesterday, but how can I do it tomorrow? to stay in business and really to, to keep growing. We use a phrase, of course, everyone's familiar with this one, blockbuster video. 
right? Mm -hmm. Everyone knows that story. And so you don't want to be Netflixed like Blockbuster Video was Netflixed. Right. That's the objective. Don't let it happen to you. Be looking ahead and understand what's it take to make sure that doesn't happen to me. Right. And, you know, it's interesting, especially in different industries. The collision industry is one that's really needs to work toward that pioneer mindset because you've got big consolidators that are coming and trying to kind of dominate the major markets. And if you're an independent shop that wants to stay in business, you're going to have to start getting creative on how you start thinking. And that's one of the things that I try to work with, at least with my clients, is how do we change the business? Do we look to specialize? Do we look to say, you know, hey, Hey, instead of taking any car that comes in, maybe we only specialize in domestic trucks or electric vehicles, or maybe, you know, brand specific, you know, a lot of the OEMs and the, the manufacturers are trying to dictate how you know, they want their cars repaired because they've engineered them a certain way and they don't want an insurance company cutting a corner that's going to compromise the integrity of the vehicle that they created that was designed to protect the passenger. Because their whole thing is, again, they want to keep the client for years and years and years. So I think this is a really important thing. So you talk about fourth quarter planning. It's interesting. I'm a big football fan. So I think it kind of resonates with me that, you know, you have to play the whole game, but we're always kind of get to that fourth quarter. So explain to the audience what you mean by this and then why it's essential for business owners. Absolutely. So if we think about every business owner, you have a time in action. Right. And so that might be 15 years, 20 years, 30, 40 years. And as you start as a business owner, we think of that as your first quarter of your time in action, of your, of your game, of the game that you're playing. Right. And you go through your second quarter, third quarter, and you get to your fourth quarter. And, and things change for a business leader. Things change. The, the, the financial dynamics change, the business, the leadership. It changes as you get to your fourth quarter. So we like to operate on the basis of begin with the end in mind, right? That's the famous saying, begin with the end in mind. And so at some point, every business owner will exit their business, either on their terms or on someone else's terms. Right. And either the business is still successful or it isn't. And either you have a team behind you that can step in and take the business forward or you don't. And so we like to think, begin with the end in mind. That's the fourth quarter. To use the football analogy a little bit more, don't wait for the two-minute warning. Hopefully, don't wait until you're in overtime. But at least realize, what do you want the end of that game to look like? And it's different for different owners. Some might say, well, I'm going to run this for a few years, and I'm going to try to find a buyer. Okay, that's one possibility. Or I've got a son or daughter that's working with me in the business. I really want to develop the son or daughter and transition the business to someone in the family. Okay. Or I've got a key person that really is showing great promise and would love to own this place. Or a couple key people that would like to team up and become the future owners. Okay, so that's an end that you have in mind. Now, what are you going to do to work towards that, to be ready for that? And especially as you hit your fourth quarter, what do I need to have in place to be successful? I may have a wonderful first three quarters and then lose the lead right? In the fourth quarter and lose the game. We've seen games like where that happens. The team runs out of ideas, runs out of plays, runs out of steam. You want to be sure that you're charging full speed ahead through the end of your fourth quarter. So you win the game. So we call it fourth quarter planning. Others might call it exit planning, succession planning, transition planning, business continuity planning. There are different things that you can call it, but we find that the business owners we work with, it resonates to say, I get it. Fourth quarter, what do we need to start to be doing be ready for a strong, solid, successful fourth quarter to win the whole game. Right. So are you working with these clients like pre fourth quarter? So I think a lot of times, you know, sometimes business owners, they come up to an event, maybe it's an illness, maybe it's, maybe they're just physically broken down you know, and they just can no longer do what they do, you know, especially in those businesses that are more highly labor, you know, collision shops, for example, contractors, people like that. And the the problem that at least I see is that they haven't done that pre-planning when they get to that fourth quarter to be able to do that. So are you looking to work with these clients like prior to the fourth quarter to start preparing them for that fourth quarter? We do. We'll work with business owners throughout all four quarters. So Some will be introduced to us to start the company. How do we do a startup? And some may be they've been in business 10, 15 years. They may be in their second or third quarter. 
and we have to look ahead. So we always ask the question, where do you want to end up? Because depending on that, we want to make sure we advise accordingly. So it, just to use an analogy, if I was in the travel business okay. and someone was introduced to me and said, hey, can you help me plan a trip? Fine, let's talk about that. But I wouldn't start to plan the trip until I ask a couple key questions. Where do you want to go? When do you want to go on the trip? What do you want to do when you get there? Who do you want to take with you? How much money are you going to need to have a good trip? Who's going to take care of things while you're on the trip? And so if someone was thinking, well, I just want to take a little trip for the weekend from Omaha to Des Moines, Mm -hmm. that's a lot different than saying, I'd like to have a month that I can spend over touring Europe. And so we start with those kind of questions. The same thing in business is understand where do you want to go and and don't make big assumptions. Just get to a good understanding of what that is because someone's fourth quarter might be starting now, or they might say, I want to do this for another 10, 20 years. What do I need to start to make sure I've got in place so I can be successful? Because just like on the trip, you don't show up at the airport and figure I'm going to take my trip now. It doesn't work. Buy my ticket at the airport, buy a ticket line up uh, my hotels and, you know, all the things, this obvious analogy, right? No, you plan it out ahead of time. So you've got the things in place. The trip works well. And if you think of your time in action as a business leader, as taking a big trip, then what do you need to line up now? So that when you're ready for that trip, it's going to go off extremely well, which is, it can always be a challenge. I mean, these days the challenge is hoping that the airplanes are flying on time. (laughs) There's always challenges that you have to plan for and adjust for and in business as well. Yeah. Question I wanted to pose to you kind of pot as you were talking about this is what about you get a business owner that is just really not sure? Like, how do you address that with them? Because I've had clients that have come to me and we start talking about some of these things, but they just like, well, I'm not sure if I want to leave the business. I'm not sure if I want to just, you know, pass it on to a key person or my children, but maybe I want to still be involved in some way as a consultant or something like that. So how do you help them to clarify in their own heads, like what this fourth quarter might look like? Sure. And that's what most of the business owners say when we visit with them. I'm not sure yet. So do I wait until I am sure? We have a couple of sayings. First, don't wait for perfect. Go for great. Right. I like that. So don't wait until you know everything. Another saying is all plans are firm until changed, but you need to have a plan. So we like to develop a plan that has options so that if you do change your mind or as things do develop, You're able to say, I've got the foundation in place that I need. So example, to use the trip analogy again, no matter where I go on the trip or when I go, I know I need a passport. So go ahead and get a passport. And then as you kind of develop, okay, now I know what I want to do. I want to go to Italy for a week and England for a week. Okay, now we can go ahead and get the air travel lined up and get the tours lined up and get the hotels lined up. But in the meantime, make sure you got enough money in the bank to take the trip wherever it's going to be. Make sure you got somebody back home taking care of things wherever the trip is going to be. Make sure you got your passport and things like that. So that definitely you lay in a foundation that then allows you options to change and adapt as things firm up as you go forward. Right. And I love the way that you kind of put this in terms that you can, I think can resonate with the business owner, whether it's talking about a trip, whether, you know, a lot of times I use either car or racing analogies in mind because it seems to be they can connect with that. So, and I know when we talked, you know, you had talked about this business model command that you utilize and how it's a foundation of the successful family business. So I'm assuming I probably know enough about this stuff to be dangerous. So I'm assuming this is part of kind of the model that you put together, but I wanted you to explain it a little better and how it is a vital component to a business's success. Sure. So every business owner needs to be able to answer three key questions. What business am I really in? Mm. Why does my business work? And how does it work? And so let's just take on for a second. How does it work? That's my business model. Every company has a business model. Every business model consists of nine building blocks, nine key components. You've got some motor vehicles in the background there uh, behind you. And so each of those motor vehicles is built on certain building blocks. They all have the same types of building blocks for the most part, all right? They got wheels, they got a frame and all those things that are common to all motor vehicles. Mm -hmm. Likewise, every business has the same components to its business model. They may look a little different, 
But if you're Amazon or if you're a little lemonade stand on the corner, you have nine components to your business model. They're different, they're more immense or work a little differently, but they're nine components. So you want to understand that well. And that's, we use what we call the business model canvas. And this is a tool developed out of Switzerland about uh, back in 2004. I had a chance to be part of that development. And it looks at your business and says, let's put it on a canvas, business model canvas that has the nine building blocks laid in there. And you can describe your company that way. So what's my value proposition? Who are my customer segments? What are my customer channels? What are my customer relationships? What are my key resources, my key activities, my key partners? What are my revenue streams? What's my cost structure? Those are the nine building blocks of a business model. And it's important as a business leader to understand that well and for your team to understand it well. How does my business model work? So everybody's pulling in the same direction and understand what's important. Right. So that's a good starting point. And it's important for, for me as an advisor to understand that as well so that I'm in sync with how your company works because not all companies work the same way. So if I don't understand that well, I can't do the job well for you because I may give you wrong advice because it doesn't fit your particular business model. Right. So, you know, and you mentioned something else and, and, and I had this in the model and I was hoping to be able to share it. Uh, let me see if I, if I can pull it up. I'll, I'll do that. For those that are watching on YouTube, yeah, you'll be able to see this. So those who are just listening to the podcast, we'll try to walk you through it. You also talk about what business are you in? And I love that question because I think a lot of times, you know, when we look at any business, we think, you know, for example, we look at McDonald's and we think, okay, it's a hamburger business or it's a restaurant business, but Ray Kroc never imagined it to be that he saw it as a real estate business, because that's really what, where the true value in the business was in the prime real estate that they were buying. So, you know, again, how are you helping business owners to, again, really identify what their primary business is? Sure. Another example. So take Airbnb. Uh, We're all familiar with Airbnb. When Airbnb originally started, they sat down in their boardroom. They had their directors, their team get together and say, answer the question, what business are we really in? Because it's going to guide and direct where do we head? And they answered this question, are we in the hospitality business or are we in the sharing business? Well, what do they do? They help people to share their real estate, their extra room or their extra cottage. In a sense, you could say they're in the sharing business, but that's not how they saw themselves. Because if they're in the sharing business, they're going to help to find other things that people can share. Your car, your power tool set that you only use once a month. Let's help people to share all their stuff. Right. That's what they said. That's not the business we're in. We're in the hospitality business. Right. It functions by helping people share their room or their cottage or their cabin but let's make that a very good experience from a hospitality standpoint. So they really drill down that way to say, that's the business we're in. A key decision up front to understand that well for the whole organization. And we know the success that they've had with that approach. So that's key. What business am I really in? And it's key for every one of your clients to really answer that because that drives how the whole team works, functions, how you grow, what your strategy is all the way forward to your success into the future. Right. And it would seem to me that that would help to uh, create a clarity of vision too for them. Right. So that's really fascinating, Nick. And, and you know, I was, I was going to try to ch- share the screen here so that at least the people that are watching on YouTube could kind of see the process, but maybe we'll talk, we'll kind of just kind of talk through it. So, you know, as we talk about the business command module, you talked about the what, which we just, just addressed, but now let's talk a little bit about the why. And, and, and so it seems to me, this is like the next step. Mm-hmm. It is. So you want to understand what business am I really in? Why does my business model work? Why does it really work? What's key to why it works? So example, we had a restaurant in Omaha. It was a Chinese restaurant. Everyone loved it. It had great clientele. People would go to it for years. And you go back, you always knew what you were going to get. You had your favorite items on the menu. Well, a buyer came in and bought the business and thought, well, new chef was going to change the menu up to be different than what it was. Within a couple months, the business failed because the new buyer, the new chef wanted his recipe. He wanted to change it. And people were used to what they had. They came in. That's why it worked. They came back because of what that restaurant had had for years. So they didn't understand their why. Why do people really come to that restaurant? By not understanding your why, 
your risk is you're going to change it and you're going to lose. And that's what happened to this restaurant. It went out of business shortly after the, the new buyer bought it. So oh. it's always important to understand the why. Okay, so here it could be because it could be a particular service feature of what you do. And you're going to work with insurance companies to make sure in the collision business, for example, that things get handled smoothly. That could be the why, because you might have decided we are really good at that, or we really have strong relationships with the insurance companies or the adjusters to handle this when there's an accident and the car needs to be repaired. That could be the why for you, and you want to make sure that you stay focused on that so that that works extremely well. But it's important for the business owner to understand that and for the team to understand that. I get it. I get it. So yeah, I can see how, again, it it seems to me that this helps to clarify the vision of the company. Am I I correct? It does help clarify the vision for the team, for the leader to understand we need to do this extremely well and focus on this because this is why our particular business works Mm. and stay focused on that. Other things may be secondary. But understand the real why does a customer come in and use your company for okay. the service that it needs? Okay. And then from there, I'm assuming then you start to look at the nine different aspects of business. Is that correct? We are. And it's from there that we think about family business continuity, that once we have a good handle on what business am I really in, why does it work, how does it work, that allows us to then make sure we have the right team in place, the leadership team in place and start to be thinking about continuity for that business owner for the duration of that owner's time in action through their fourth quarter, and then for what the team will look like to carry the business forward into the future. Right, right. And I think that that whole idea of continuity is a great term. And I think it's one that too many times business owners take for granted. I'm working with a client right now who he keeps telling me, I've got everything up here. And I was teasing him. I said, so if something happens to you, what are we just supposed to like cut open your head and get all of that out of there? <laughs> you know, and I think, you know, again, having that vision and then also being able to put these plans in place and working with the team together will help with that continuity. So business owners all want to get to that fourth quarter. So how do you help them to clarify that this is important to have this continuity plan in place? Sure. Really very straightforward. And so often the way that it worked for us is we'll have an advisor that is working with a business owner. Can we just sit down and talk, get on a conference or video call because we work with companies around the country. Mm -hmm. We get on a video call for an hour, hour and a half with the advisor and, and with the business owner. Okay. And let's talk through where we're at and where we're seeing this head. And, and we'll ask six key questions. Okay. And it, it, who, what, where, when, why, and how much that's okay. what we ask. And in the course of an hour, we get a good idea as to what the plan is. Who do you think you want to transfer the business to whenever that is, right? Who, what do you want to transfer? What do you want to keep? Sometimes someone says, I want to keep the real estate, transfer the operations. So okay. who, what, where, where do you want to be when this is done? How do you see your life changing? Are you going to stay in town? Going to, going to move somewhere else? Going to go into another business? So who, what, where, when? When do you see your transition? Because everyone's going to transition 10 years, five years, 20 years, two years. So who, what, where, when, why? Why are we talking? Why is this on your mind? Mm -hmm. Someone might say, look, bad news. I just got diagnosed with cancer. Okay. That's, we need to know that. And because that might be driving this or my spouse and I would like to move somewhere else and being closer to the grandchildren. Okay. So that's the why, who, what, where, when, why, and how much. So we think about eventually when you're going to retire or transfer your business, how much do you need or want? How much do you have in the bank now? How much do you need or want to receive from transferring business? And it needs to line up because if you say, I need $2 million, what's the business worth? It's worth $1 million today. How much money do you have in the bank? Not very much. And to retire tomorrow. Well, that doesn't fit, right? right. So you need to say, if you need $2 million or $5 million or whatever the number is, then what do you have and what do you need out of the business? Very quickly, we get a good feel for where someone is at just by going through those six questions in an hour. Okay. Then if we can be of assistance, we learn very quickly what we could do to help with the situation. If not, we spend a nice hour, hour and a half phone conversation, 
at least with some ideas about where the team should head into the future. So very easy. It's just no real prep needed. Get on a call, see where we're going to go. And if the next steps, that's great. If it doesn't, then maybe it will next time when the owners are ready to talk a little bit further about uh, the situation and where they see the future. Right, right. And, you know, I can't stress enough for any business owner that's listening to this about starting to plan early. And it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily means, and like I said, Nick's got even more experience in this than I have, but um, I don't think you need to um, have a, a real firm picture of what you want to do, but at least start the planning process early because, you know, too many times, you know, like Nick said, somebody gets cancer and now you're under a time crunch because you may not have the value in the business. You may not have the assets to be able to live the lifestyle that you want to live. And the more time we have to prepare, the better it is. Exactly right. And so ideally there's some lead time. Sometimes someone comes in and says, I don't have any lead time. Right. Well, then we'll work what we can to make that to work well, but it's, it's better to have some lead time. So, and that's why we talk in terms of fourth quarter. We don't talk in terms of two minute warning. So ideally, at least by what you expect is your fourth quarter that we're sitting down and we're talking about this. Sometimes the fourth quarter, it, it, the circumstances change. And yeah. so it, it could go very quickly if there's an unexpected something in someone's life. But ideally, if we're planning ahead for kind of normal times, start at the beginning of your fourth quarter, at least by then. And to use a trip analogy, at least get your passport, okay? at least get some savings. So when you do know where you want that trip to be and when you want it to be, you're primed and ready to take the trip. That's exactly right. And the fourth quarter analogy, it's interesting. I was thinking back, uh, I listened to Colin Cowherd, who's on, uh, uh, he's a sports commentator on, uh, on Fox Sports. And he had Sean Payton, who was the uh, past coach of the New Orleans Saints on, and he's been having him on every week. And it was, it's interesting getting into his head because he talks about in the game, how, you know, games on Sunday, usually they give them a day off on Monday, but he and the coaching staff are already in starting to put the game plan in place for the next Sunday and how they break it down. And it's like, okay, here's the first scripted plays in the first quarter. Here's what we're going to do on first and second down. And they get all those plays so that on Tuesday practice, they can, they can practice those. And then Tuesday they're already planning for, okay, here's third and long. Okay. Or third in this distance. And then, you know, third and short, and here's the play place for this, you know, and then Thursday they're working on putting their goal line, but they're putting all this planning in place from the start of the week, right after the last game. And I think, you know, when we look at business continuity planning, it needs to be done in the same way that the earlier we can address this and start putting the basics in place and then get down to, we can start to work down to the minutia. I think you're going to have a much more prosperous fourth quarter. Is that, I mean, is that pretty much what you're saying there, Nick? Exactly right. And what you're describing at the professional football level is also done at the college football level right. and the high school football level. Right. That the coaches understand the need to be planning ahead of that game for the possibilities that might happen. And that's key to success. And, and coaches understand they've got a responsibility to the players and to the fans and to whoever else is, is vested in the interest of the outcome of those games. So they understand that. They know they need to plan. And that's just a simple game. That's a little sport. And so here we think about people's livelihoods, all the colleagues that a business owner has in their family business that are dependent on that business. And so it's, a, it's just important to say, I've got a plan ahead. I've got people to support there, depending on how well we can keep the business going and stay prosperous. And so it takes, it just takes a little time to sit back and say, let's plan for the future. Yeah, exactly. So that we know there is the future we hope for, for our colleagues. Yep. I certainly get it. And you know what? I, it's, I just, I don't think any, either of us can stress this enough, how this early planning and how important that is. And so, you know, Nick, we could go on and on about this. We're at our time limit. Is there any final thoughts you just want to leave to everybody? I would just say that as you started the need to plan, no one plans to fail. They fail to plan. It's a great point. I think that if everyone just thinks about that for a few moments, have I done the planning that I need to do for the sake of myself, my family, my spouse, colleagues in the business that look to me as, as the business owner in that business. Have I done what I need to be doing now? And start the process. It's a fairly easy start. And from there, matter, let's, let's determine what needs to be put in place now and then come back and do what needs to be done later when it's the right time. 
Right. right. You know, and I think again, sometimes it can be stressful to start to think about these things, but I think once you do it, it's going to give you such a peace of mind to know that you at least have a plan in place that, I mean, it'll just make your life much more productive, at least. Exactly. And that's why we say we'll start with a phone call and no need to prepare for it. Just get on the phone and start to talk it through and decide from there what should be done. Yeah, exactly. So if any of this intrigues you, you can always contact us. You can go to my website, highliftfinancial.com. Click on the Let's Talk. If you want to talk to Nick, I can put you in touch with them. Or we'll also have Nick's direct information in the show notes so that if you want to have that hour conversation with him, you'll have a very easy way to get a hold of him there too. So Nick, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. And the last thanks always goes to you, the listener. Thank you for listening to Your Business, Your Life with me, Matt DeFrancesco. And if you've not subscribed to the podcast, please click on the subscribe button below. That way, when a new episode comes out, it'll download directly to your advice. You can listen and then share with your friends and family or anybody that you think might find value in this information. Also, please give us a five-star review if you like what you're hearing. That way we can move up the charts and we can get this information available to more people. So I want to thank Nick for being on the podcast. I want to thank you for listening. And from everybody here at High Lift Financial, let's make every day your best day. So take care and God bless. Hey, I really want to thank you for listening to the Your Business, Your Life podcast. If you want to be notified when new episodes become available, click the subscribe button below. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of High Lift Financial. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investment, legal, or tax advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified professional with any questions you may have regarding your business or personal planning. DeFrancesco Financial Concierge, LLC, DBA, High Lift Financial, is a registered investment advisor. Registration with the United States Securities and Exchange Commission or any state security authority does not imply a certain level of skill or training.